Hey friends, two days ago I did my first like official debate on uh, Kyle Whittington's channel, uh, linked in the video description down below, uh, in case you haven't seen it. Uh, and today I'm going to present my opening statement and my rebuttal uh, together uh, in just like, you know, a more HD format, I suppose. Um, uh, but if you've already seen it, you can go ahead and skip that part because I'm also adding something to the end and that is just a quick, you know, soon after the debate reflection. Whenever you do a debate, uh, if you've done a good debate, uh, you're going to reflect on it probably for a long time after. It's been two days for me, uh, so there hasn't been a ton of time for me to reflect, but there's been a little bit, of, you know, there's been enough time for me to reflect such that I have a couple thoughts that I would like to share. Uh, but first I'll go through the presentation for those of you who don't love sitting there through a two hour long debate. Um, and then after the presentation, I will do the reflection. Let's begin. In early June, Dave, Kyle, and I got together in a group chat, and we proposed this debate on the authorship of the Gospels. I would be taking the affirmative on the stance that the Gospels are indeed anonymous, to which Dave was taking the negative. No, the Gospels are not anonymous. You see, at first, this prompt filled me with a devious glee. I had planned on just spending about 10 hours reading all four Gospels back to back to back to back, declaring that, technically speaking, the Gospels are internally anonymous, and then declaring a victory. But Dave is a wily opponent, and he, within only minutes of agreeing on the prompt, suggested that we agree on what we mean by anonymity. A lot of skeptics, Dave says, in his experience, tend to define anonymity as an author failing to identify himself by name in the written body of the text, and obviously, Dave agrees that the Gospels are anonymous in that sense, but he proposes this definition for Gospel uh, anonymity. The thesis that the authors of the Gospels are unknown both to us and the earliest Christians. He asked if that's okay with me, and I dejectedly said that that would be fine. So that meant that I actually had some work to do in the debate two days ago. Uh, and I like to think that I did. So let's jump into it. A good place to start would be defining what we mean by the anonymity hypothesis. The anonymity hypothesis states that the Gospels were written in the second half of the first century, and then the traditional names weren't ascribed to them, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, until around 100 years later in the second half of the second century. Uh, the general idea is that Matthew was written in like the 70s, I'm sorry, Mark was written in the 70s, uh, Matthew and Luke in the 80s, John in the 90s, and then by 150 AD, still nobody was calling them by those names, but around like 170 AD, that's when people started using those names, and then definitely by like 180 AD, that's when people were definitely using those names. Um, why those dates? Well, Irenaeus published Against Heresies in around 185, uh, and Irenaeus is clearly using the Gospels by name. However, Justin Martyr was writing in 155, and he wasn't using the Gospels by name. So that's kind of the idea, that sometime between 155 and 185, the name stuck. I kind of just drew a line down the middle, said 170. So for tonight's presentation, I'm arguing that 170 is around that year when the Gospel names stuck. Before 170, nobody was referring to the Gospels by the names that we refer to them as today. It was only after 170 that those traditional names were ascribed to them. Data that falls outside of that 170 range will not affect the case for anonymity at all. Dave and I already agree that the Gospels had the traditional names ascribed to them by the end of the second century. Where we disagree is if the names had stuck before then in the hundred-ish years between writing and then 170. I will be presenting evidence of anonymity within the late first and early second century for my opening statement. And then in my rebuttal, I will be rebutting some of the popular uh, arguments that people use to support traditional authorship. One important thing to start with before we get into the uh, data itself is that gospel anonymity is indeed the majority scholarly opinion. How do I know this? Well, I was presenting on a Catholic channel, so I started by appealing to Catholic authors. On page 13 of The Case for Jesus, Dr. Brant Petrie says that by the end of the 20th century, uh, gospel anonymity hypothesis was so widespread that it was hardly ever even discussed. The Catholic Encyclopedia, which bears the Nihil Obstat, uh, also admits that, quote, the first four historical books of the New Testament are supplied with the titles, which, however, ancient do not go back to their respective authors of those sacred texts. 
My favorite New Testament author, Father Raymond Brown, was a Catholic priest, and his monumental work and introduction to the New Testament suggests that the Gospels are likely anonymous as well. And just like the Catholic Encyclopedia, this work also contains the Nihil Opsat, in case that matters to you. Um, you know, what was the case, though, on uh, the debate two days ago is that some people in the audience were probably not Catholic, and worse, Dave and I aren't Catholic, so we might not actually care about uh, what Catholic sources say. So and if that's the case, I could appeal to the long list of non-Catholic Christian scholars and secular scholars who also affirm gospel anonymity. Here are quotes from the non-Catholic Christian scholars from Union Theological Seminary and Fuller Theological Seminary, as well as secular scholars from Yale and Seton Hall. Yes, I know that Seton Hall is technically a Catholic school, but like half my family went to Seton Hall, and trust me, that is not really a Catholic school. I could go on and on and on listing uh, scholars and other authorities who agree that the Gospels are anonymous, but I would be more or less wasting my time. Kinda. I do know and agree that the appeal to popularity and the appeal to authority, those are fallacies. And nobody should believe something simply because an authority says so or because it's popular to do so. However, it might give somebody who hasn't really looked into this yet reason to take this theory seriously. I'm thinking of my past self when I say this. I grew up traditional Catholic, not really questioning who wrote the Gospels. I mean, it's obvious, right? The names are <laughs> right at the top. It wasn't until I learned that so many scholars take this theory so seriously that I really started looking into it, and then I did become convinced that the Gospels are indeed anonymous. I am not saying that my past self should have just said, oh, wow, look how popular this idea is. I better believe it. No, no, no. My past self should have and indeed did say, look how popular this theory is. I should investigate it further. I did investigate it further, and today I am convinced that the evidence does support anonymity. Let's dig into that evidence now. This is how I see the evidence of anonymity. In my opening statement, we'll go over the evidence for anonymity, and then in my rebuttal, we are going to be looking at the evidence for traditional authorship and then attempting to rebut it. I'm going to focus most of my opening statement on the church father attributions, and I'm going to spend no time at all on internal anonymity because Dave and I already agreed before the start of the debate that the Gospels are indeed internally anonymous. Our first example of an early Christian writing that treats the Gospels as being anonymous is the Didache. The Didache is considered to be part of a second-generation Christian group of writings known collectively as the Apostolic Fathers. The Didache itself is anonymous, but that's kind of besides the point. The work was considered, this work, the Didache, was considered by some of the Apostolic Fathers to be part of the New Testament, and the Didache may even be older than the Gospel of John. This treatise shares phrases and content found particularly in the Gospel of Matthew. In chapter 8, the Didache quotes the Lord's Prayer as written in Matthew chapter 6, verses 9 to 13, and indeed attributes that quote to a written source, but not to the Gospel of Matthew. Instead, the Didache refers to its source as his gospel, his referring to the Lord's, or the Lord's gospel, without providing attribution to the disciple Matthew. Elsewhere, the Didache refers to its written sources as the gospel of the Lord and the ordinances of the gospel. Again, anonymous attributions. Again, no mention whatsoever of the four traditional authors. This supports the idea that soon after the gospels were written, they were in circulation anonymously. Let's go to the next example. First Clement is also one of the first, one of the most ancient non-biblical Christian texts that we have. First Clement may also be older than the Gospel of John. It may be. While the author of First Clement is debated and while the letter is internally anonymous, this letter still provides us with a late first century quote of the Gospels that does not support the traditional author. First Clement 13.2 clearly quotes from either Luke 6 or Matthew 7, uh, do not judge lest ye be judged, uh, but again, referring to it only as the words of the Lord Jesus. Second Clement does the same thing. Second Clement was probably not written by the same guy who wrote First Clement, but it's still a very early work, tail end of the first century, beginning of the second century. And it likewise quotes from Matthew, Mark, and Luke without citing the author's names as well. Ignatius of Antioch quotes from the Synoptics at some point in the first half of the second century in his letter to the Romans. Again, anonymously. 
he never says that he is quoting from Mark 8 or Matthew 16 or Luke 9. That this quote in question, for what shall a profit a man if he gain the whole world but lose his soul, is part of the triple tradition, so it's in all three of them. But Ignatius does not mention Matthew, Mark, or Luke. Again, Ignatius is writing in like 100 to 140, so definitely the first half of the second century. Then there's Polycarp, who does the exact same thing as Clement and Ignatius and the Didache, referring to something that we would recognize as coming from the synoptics, but Polycarp never mentions an author's name, only referring to it as the words which the Lord spoke. We'll do one more, and I kind of think of this last person as like the tail end of the anonymity era, and that would be Justin Martyr. Justin Martyr makes repeated and unmistakable references to the content found in the Gospels, but does not once reference any of the four evangelists that we attribute with the authors today. Never. Instead, he refers to these writings as a single volume that he just generically dubs the Memoirs of the Apostles, treating the Apostles, the Memoirs of the Apostles, as some kind of unitary source. In all of Justin's voluminous writings, he never delineates or otherwise distinguishes the Memoirs by name. But Justin does typically treat his, his other sources quite differently. While Justin always refers to the memoirs anonymously, it is telling that Justin does reference his other sources by name when he's discussing or citing them. For example, from the Old Testament, Justin will cite from Zechariah, Malachi, and the Psalms. He'll also reference non-canonical Christian writings, such as uh, uh, Zechariah, oh, I'm sorry, such as uh, Esdras and the pseudo-letter of Jeremiah. And he references pagans too, like Plato and Pythagoras by name but never the Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John that we know of today, even though he cites from them. At one point, Justin recalls the story that we find at the beginning of Mark, where Jesus is baptizing uh, John the Baptist and others in the River Jordan, uh, and he only refers to it as the memoir of the apostles, not citing any of the gospels that we would know by name. And what's funny is that in Justin Martyr's recollection, the River Jordan catches on fire while Jesus is baptizing people. That should paint a picture for you that the Gospels looked really different for Justin Martyr than they did for us. Likely, before like 170, the Gospels were kind of floating around in these free-form uh, collections of writings. A lot of them may have only been the sayings of the Lord that are found in the Gospels, but they may not have even been in the entire Gospel collection like we know of today. This should all be painting a picture, but let's look at some other evidence of anonymity before we go to the rebuttal. I think that the synoptic problem is a real problem for the traditional authorship view. Perhaps the synoptic problem is better referred to as the synoptic puzzle. I'm fine with using either one, but regardless. The traditional authorship view holds that Mark was writing Peter's testimony, Luke was recording what he had heard of the events from Paul, who had heard from the Twelve, and Matthew was literally an eyewitness. If this is the case, I would not expect a high degree of literary interdependence between the three, yet that is exactly what we see. Only 3% of Mark is uniquely Markan, 20% of uh, Matthew is uniquely Mathean, and 35% of Luke is uniquely Lucan. Maybe Luke gets a pass for having heard everything third hand, right, through Paul through the Twelve, but it's super strange that Mark is essentially writing down whatever Peter tells him to, and Matthew is an eyewitness, and Matthew either copies super heavily from Mark or Mark copies super heavily from Matthew. I, I am a Mark and priority guy, so I do think that Matthew's copying from Mark, but it doesn't matter what your view of priority is. The fact that they're copying from each other at all is super weird given the traditional authorship view. I don't think that makes a whole lot of sense in light of the traditional authorship view. I think it makes a lot more sense in the anonymity view. The original language is a small problem as well. Maybe not a huge problem, but it's a small problem for the traditional view. Galilean fishermen would not have been literate. And Acts does specifically call Peter and John illiterate. So if John was illiterate, that makes the authorship of John kind of funny. But Peter didn't write the Gospel of Mark, right? Mark wrote Mark, and maybe that kind of makes sense, right? Peter was illiterate, so he had Mark write down his Gospel. Well, Acts 12.12 12 says that after Peter escaped from Herod's jail cell, he went to Mark's mom's house in Galilee. Herod ruled over the area on this slide that is uh, it colored in. That's all pretty rural land in the first century ancient Near East. The chances of somebody being born there, being literate, is very, very low. Not only that, but literacy in general was just super low 
even for tax collectors. There's a common apologetic technique where people will say, oh, well, Matthew probably knew how to write because he was a tax collector. Not so. Matthew was not like an accountant today where you needed to go to college and get a four-year degree to be an accountant. No. A tax collector in the ancient Near East would have been somebody who went door-to-door -door knocking on their doors asking for their money, kind of like hired muscle. In fact, we only know of one first century ancient Near Eastern Jew who was capable of writing. Josephus. That's it. Obviously, Paul was capable of writing too, but he's not from that area. From that area, the only person that we know of who is able to uh, write at that level is Josephus. Luke may be exempt from this criticism. Luke supposedly was a doctor and he hung out with Paul and Paul was like hyper-educated. So I do exempt Luke from this criticism, but I think that this criticism does lower the chances for traditional authorship for the other three Gospels. Lastly, I want to bring up some dating tensions. The Gospel of Mark was probably written sometime around 70, Matthew and Luke in like 85, and then John in like 90. Average life expectancy in the Roman ancient Near East was 30, but... Average life expectancy, assuming that you make it to 10, was more like 50. So, um, assuming that Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John were each like 10 years younger than Jesus, which is probably about right, they would have been pretty darn old at the time that they wrote their Gospels. Anywhere from like 65 years old to like 85 years old. Living to 65 to 85, when the average life expectancy is 50, is not impossible, but it does seem like another chip on the scale in favor of anonymity. So if this is all the case, then what were the Gospels being called prior to 170? Well, evidently they were being called like the Gospel of the Lord, right? That's what we saw in the quotations from the Apostolic Fathers. But another clue that these were being called the Gospel of the Lord is right under our noses in Mark 1.1, 1, 1, the beginning of the good news about Jesus, the Messiah, the beginning of the euangelion of Jesus, I think that the Gospels were just called the good news about Jesus or the good news of Jesus or something like that. Not the good news according to Jesus, but the good news of Jesus. In fact, I think it would be super weird if Mark wrote a Gospel and he begins with Galion of Jesus, but then he titles it Galion according to Mark. Like, that'd be kind of weird, wouldn't it? So I feel like that's just another thing, too, that's kind of like weird, uh, that doesn't make a whole lot of sense under the traditional authorship view, but does make sense under the uh, anonymity view. That wraps up my opening statement, and now I'm going to launch right into my rebuttal. I already teased what I'm going to present, and that's the manuscript evidence, the church father attributions, and the internal evidence in favor of traditional authorship. I'm going to try to critique that to the best of my ability. Let's take a look first at the manuscript evidence. Page 16 from The Case for Jesus is perhaps one of the most like well-circulated pages of like any apologetic book that I've ever seen. Page 16 makes Christians go, hell yeah, brother, when they see it. By the way, this is a picture of Dr. Brant Petrie. Uh, uh, not a lot of people know what he looks like because he doesn't do like public talks and stuff like that. Um, but I pulled this directly from his LinkedIn. So that is Dr. Brant Petrie. And he's saying his catchphrase, you're finished, because he says that whenever he's debating somebody. And um, and this is like, uh, like the trump card that a lot of trad authorship uh, supporting folks pull out when they are trying to support trad authorship. But there's a problem with this table. Can you see it? Let's remember what the anonymity hypothesis is. We know that the trad names were attached sometime in the latter half of the first century, and the Gospels were being treated, uh, treated anonymously before then. I'm kind of picking that 170 date. I can move that forward or backwards by a decade or two. and it, I can't move it backwards by two decades, but, you know, one and a half decades, I guess. Um, regardless, um, we can move it forwards or backwards by about 15 years, and that really wouldn't change the anonymity hypothesis too much. Um, but regardless, nothing outside of that 170 range is going to impact my case. Let's take a look at Dr. Petrie's list again, crossing out every manuscript that isn't at least touching the second century. Hmm. I've now crossed out all the manuscripts that don't come from the second century, and there's only five. Really, it's four, because Dr. Petrie counts Papyrus 75 twice. Why was Dr. Petrie including so many manuscripts from the 3rd, 4th, and even 5th centuries? I don't know for sure, but one possible reason is that he just wanted to show off, like, the prowess of modern archaeology. And, yeah, fair enough. 
we have uncovered so many awesome manuscripts that are pretty darn early. Like the 5th century, all things considered, is really early, especially compared to other works that we don't have for like, you know, a thousand years after they were written. So 5th century is great, but it's not 1st century or 2nd century. I only have these four manuscripts, Papyrus 4, 62, 75, and 66. And even then, Dr. Petrie was being very generous on his dating. In particular, Papyrus 62 seems to be pretty conclusively dated to the 4th century, yet Dr. Petrie listed as being dated anywhere from the 2nd to the 4th century. He did do this for some others, like Papyrus. Uh, uh, he listed Papyrus, for instance, 75 as being from the 2nd to 3rd century, which is great. I largely agree with that, though it it looks like it's pretty much the third century, but you know, close enough that I'm willing to I'm willing to let that one uh, let that one go. Um, but uh, Papyrus uh, four, for example, um, Doctor Petrie lists as being clearly in the second century. When I look it up, I've seen dates from anywhere from like the tail end of the second century to the fourth century, and Doctor Petrie listed only as being second century. So I don't think that's quite fair either. Um, but let's go ahead and graph these four papyri on my table and see if they impact my argument at all. They don't. I assigned Papyrus 4 a very generous date of 180 AD, and this still does not move the needle on the anonymity hypothesis. And then before we put the manuscript evidence portion of the rebuttal behind us, I did want to bring up one more piece of manuscript evidence that Dave actually brought up before I did. Dave addressed this in his opening statement if you want to go watch the debate, and that would be Papyrus 1. Papyrus run is dated to like 250 AD. The picture on the slide here is the first page of Papyrus 1. You can tell it's the first page because, look at the top, there's an alpha at the top of the page. In Greek, uh, writing alpha at the top of a page was like writing 1. So this is page 1, this is page alpha, this is the first page. Notice, there is no Uangelion kata Matthew or the good news according to Matthew in English at the top of page 1. Now, I actually do think that this gospel did have a title attached to it at some point. It comes from 250 AD. That's almost 100 years after I would expect the gospel names to have stuck by then. So I suspect that it was there somewhere and we just no longer have it. There's two different ways that this could happen. The first is that there could have been like a title page that has been lost and that title would have just said like when Galeon caught a Matthew on it somewhere. Or it could have been at the end of the manuscript. We are missing the end of Papyrus 1. Consider the Apocryphon of John from the Mog Hamadi Library. That manuscript had um, the title at the end of the manuscript, so this also could have had the title at the end of the manuscript. Regardless, I just kind of think it's funny that Papyrus 1 doesn't make mention at all in The Case, of, the case for Jesus by Dr. Brand, Brand Petrie. I think he does that because this is somewhat evidence against his case. Now, I don't even think this is great evidence against the case. But the fact that Dr. Petrie doesn't include it is kind of telling that the case for Jesus is an apologetic work, not a scholarly work. Anyway, the next section that I'd like to rebut is the church fathers. Now, when I was putting together these slides, I almost decided to make this just church father, singular. But I'll talk about uh, Polycarp in addition to Papias, but I'm going to spend way more time on Papias than I am on anybody else. This is from Church History, Book 3, Chapter 39, verses 14 to 16. Mark, having been the interpreter and translator of Peter, wrote down accurately, however not in order, all that he recalled of what was either said or done by the Lord. Further on, but not with a view of making an orderly account of the Lord's sayings, logia, he made it his aim to omit nothing. And then regarding Matthew, he says, Matthew arranged in order the sayings in Hebrew, and each one interpreted or translated as he was able. Let's start with Mark. This doesn't sound like our Mark. Papias calls this a logia, a sayings gospel. When you see the word logia, you should be thinking about the gospel of Thomas, not the gospel of Mark. More on that on the next slide. Papias said that Mark wrote in no specific order, which does not track with our Mark. Though I should note on the logia thing, Papias does say that uh, Mark wrote down the sayings and the deeds of the Lord. So maybe Mark gets a pass on the logia thing, but... Um, no specific order is strange because that doesn't track with our mark. Our mark does seem to be in an order. Um, it's not like our mark starts off with the wedding feast of Cana and then goes to the ascension and then the crucifixion and then the baptism in the river Jordan. No, no, no. Our mark is chronologically ordered. 
Papia says that Mark left nothing out, which doesn't make sense in light of the fact that Mark is the shortest gospel. This would be particularly weird if Papias also knew about the Matthew that we have, since Matthew includes so much more than Mark does. And then, with regard to Matthew, Papias calls this work a logia straight up, not like he does with Mark where he says words and deeds, he just says words, just logia. Again, more on what a logia is on the next slide, but what makes it even weirder is that Papias says that this was written in Hebrew. He says, Hebraise dialecto, Hebrew language, Hebrew tongue. Some people will argue that Hebraized dialecto could mean a Hebrew dialect of Greek, which would make more sense to me since our gospel was written in Greek. But again, that's not really what that word means. It doesn't mean dialect. It means language. It's like a false cognate. Um, some people think that Matthew would have been writing in Aramaic if he really wrote the gospel anyway, not Hebrew. So it being in Hebrew doesn't really make a whole lot more sense than it being in Greek. So some people, that makes some people think that Papias was just wrong and he actually wrote it in uh, Aramaic, not Hebrew, and Papias didn't know the difference maybe. That's another option, but again, we actually have no evidence of the Gospel of Matthew being composed, our Gospel of Matthew anyway, being composed in any other language besides Greek. We are fairly confident that this, that this was composed in Greek. So whatever Matthew Papias is talking about, it's not our Matthew. It may be the elusive Hebrew Matthew that we've never been able to find. In fact, that is what I think. I think that Papias is referring to documents that were attributed to Mark or Matthew that have been lost. This Logia of Mark may have been similar to the Gospel of Thomas, but it just would have been like the Gospel of Mark, but it would have been like the Sayings Gospel of Mark. Um, and maybe this was like a Hebrew Sayings Gospel of Matthew as well. I don't think that we can know for sure, but... All roads lead to our Matthew being written in Greek. So for those reasons, I don't think that Papias is talking about our Mark or our Matthew. So what is a logia anyway? Well, consider the gospel according to Thomas, which is a sayings gospel, a logia gospel. Notice how it's just sayings. It's in no particular order. There's no narrative to speak of, no plot. It's just, these are the secret sayings of the living Jesus, which Didymus Judas Thomas wrote down. Tom, uh, Jesus said, whoever finds these, uh, the interpretation of these sayings will not experience death. Jesus said, let him who seeks continue seeking until he finds, etc." Jesus said, Jesus said, Jesus said, Jesus said. His disciples questioned him and they asked him, do you want us to fast? And Jesus said, Jesus said, and he said, that's it. That's a logia. There are other logia out there too, such as the Dialogues of the Savior, another early Christian text. That's an apocryphal work dating to like 150 AD. And some scholars think that whatever Q may have been was probably a logia. But anyway, the Gospel of Thomas is what a logia looks like. Our Matthew and our Mark are not logia, they are Uangelion. For a more complete uh, uh, description of the arguments that I just laid out about why we don't think that Papias is writing about our Mark and our Matthew, um, I would reference the chapter on Mark and the chapter on Matthew in uh, an introduction to the New Testament by Father Raymond E. Brown. Um, I've snipped the pages from Mark here and put them down. Um, this is a fantastic book that I highly recommend to anybody who wants to learn more about the New Testament. And that brings me to Polycarp. This is, to me, a quick point. Some people like to point to Polycarp as having studied under John, and John obviously was a disciple, and so he saw Christ. And they point to this for like a reason why John really wrote the gospel. I don't entirely understand this argument since Polycarp never mentions that John wrote John, but Irenaeus mentions that Polycarp says that John wrote John, I think, something like that. Um, but regardless, um, I'm not at all convinced that Polycarp studied under John. I think that when Polycarp was a kid, he like attended one of John's sermons or something, since not even the martyrdom of Polycarp, which is a document that we have that was written right after Polycarp's death. It's like a fawning eulogy of him. It's like, these are all of the great things about Polycarp. That never mentions that he knew or studied under John. That seems like a pertinent place to mention that. And so the omission that Polycarp knew John from the uh, martyrdom of Polycarp says to me that Polycarp definitely didn't study under John. Maybe he like bumped into him as a kid. I don't think that he studied under him though. Next up, we're going to take a look at the internal evidence, and this is where I ran out of time in the actual debate. I'm not even sure that Matthew was the tax collector among the 12. There may not have been a tax collector among the 12. Mark chapter 2 says that um, as Jesus was walking along, he saw Levi, the son of Alphaeus, sitting at the tax booth and said, follow me. 
Luke chapter 5. Jesus saw Levi sitting in the tax booth and said, follow me. Matthew changes Levi's name to Matthew, saying, follow me. Mark then lists the 12 as follows. He lists Matthew, Thomas, James, the son of Alphaeus. Notice that he lists James, the son of Zebedee, and John, the brother of James, together, the sons of thunder. But he does not list Matthew and James together. Luke does the same thing. Matthew, Thomas, James, son of Alphaeus, Simon. He does not put Matthew and James, son of Alphaeus, together. Whoever the son of Alphaeus was would be the brother of James, the son of Alphaeus. It seems weird because a lot of people want to argue that Matthew and Levi are the same person. Look, it's the same story. It's just switching two names out, like, you know, switching out Levi for Matthew. That must mean that Levi and Matthew are the same person. I don't think that's the case. I think that if Matthew and Levi were the same person, we would see Matthew and James and Amalphias being listed together the way that we see James and John being listed together. It was pretty common to list brothers together. And so if James and Matthew were brothers, it seems weird that they would be separated by Thomas. And it would be weird that they don't call them out as uh, siblings. Notice then that Matthew changes Matthew to Matthew the publican. So we have two accounts where we have Levi, son of Alphaeus, who is the tax collector. Jesus says, follow me. And evidently, Levi's not one of the 12, but Matthew is. But then in Matthew, the name of Levi is changed to Matthew. And then Jesus says to Matthew, follow me. And then there is a Matthew among the 12. So it's two to one. So it's not clear to me either way, but... Two to one makes me think that Levi was the tax collector, not one of the 12. Matthew was one of the 12, not a tax collector. I don't know. Just kind of weird. You could see more of that here. I'm just kind of putting the, uh, the, uh, the texts side by side by side. And then I'm also quoting from Ben Witherington III from Asbury Theological Seminary. I've been there. Um, and then also from John Painter. Um, these are a little bit older. These are from 2001 and 97, but I think that the points stand. Um, it's also interesting that in Mark, the omissions of Levi from the list of the 12 has led to textual variance so that the name of Levi is actually changed to James, the son of Alphaeus in some texts. So that means that James, the son of Alphaeus was the tax collector in some textual variants of Mark. That's kind of weird. This is pretty clearly a scribal attempt to harmonize what was perceived by one of the scribes to be a discrepancy. So I'm not at all confident that Matthew was actually a tax collector to begin with. Anyway, that's about all of the time that I had for the uh, for the rebuttal period. Um, and, and I'm going to end it there. Now let's talk some reflection. In my closing statement and in the comments and such, I, I, I tried to end on the note that if you leave a debate with the exact same credence in your opponent's position as the kind of credence that you have when you started, you wasted your time. I'm not interested in debating people who I think will not change my credence at all. I think that's kind of pointless. There's two different ways that an opponent, like if I, there's two different ways in which I might think that somebody won't change my credence at all. And that's could be because of the person or it could be because of the topic. So the person might be like, I'm not super interested in dating like a presuppositionalist, for instance. If we don't even agree on like basic epistemology, I don't think that you're going to really be able to change my credence in much of anything. If that's the case, I don't think it's really worth my time to, be, to debate a presuppositionalist. But then there's also other topics that I don't think I'm going to change my credence very much on. Things like, does sleeping with your cell phone near your head cause brain cancer? I'm not going to debate that topic. Uh, first, I'm just like, frankly not that interested in that topic. Um, and then I'm just like not an expert in that topic. Now, I'm also not an expert in, in textual criticism, but I am really interested in it. Um, and so I'm like quite open to having my credence changed on... Uh, uh, textual criticism by non-experts because I'm interested in it. I'm just frankly not that interested in having my opinion changed by an, by non-experts with regard to like, do cell phones cause brain cancer if you sleep with them too close to your head? I'm going to let the experts do that one out and I'm just going to trust them on it. Just, just because I, I don't really care that much. But I am interested in the authorship of the Gospels. I'm not satisfied with just taking the experts at their word. And Dave is an incredibly intelligent and open-minded debate opponent. And I'm happy to report that I did leave our debate with a different credence than where I started with. 
Don't misunderstand me. I still do think that the Gospels were anonymous for the first hundred-ish years of their circulation. But one thing that I learned in our debate, uh, one thing that like I may have like shifted my credence somewhat, is the use of the word logia. So I didn't know that Irenaeus used the word logia to refer to the Gospels that we know of. Now, I'm still at this time not aware of uh, a point where anybody actually quotes from our Gospels, calling them logia, but then quotes something that's not just the sayings of the Lord. If somebody quoted, like clearly quoted from our Gospels, referred to them as a logia, that would shift my credence further. And it's possible that Irenaeus did that. I haven't entirely done my homework yet. Um, but Dave knows what he's talking about and he says that that did happen. So obviously I'm going to like look into it further. But um, just the like uncertainty that I have now about the like my, like if the point that I brought up about logia isn't as strong of a point as I thought previously, then of course it shifts my credence closer to the trad authorship side. I don't think that I can exactly uh, give, like put numbers on it. I think that putting numbers on things is kind of silly sometimes. Um, what I think I can do is I can say like, you know, if this is like the, the full spectrum, right? If, if this is the full spectrum of belief with like being perfectly in the middle um, is like you are totally agnostic. Um, if this is the side of anonymity, if I was here, now I'm here. And I think that's a good thing. I think that if you're debating somebody and your credence doesn't change at all, I think that you wasted your time. Um, so that, that's kind of like the, 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 the one reflection that I wanted to bring up, um, that did bring me closer to the trad authorship side is the word logia and the, the times that it may have been used, um, uh, for something that isn't, um, just a sayings gospel. Okay. There is something else though that I wanted to reflect upon, um, where this didn't change my credence. I think that this may, and, and. Dave didn't really bring this up. This was something that the comments brought up. And if I'm good in editing, I will put some of the comments that came up um, below down here. And that is that some people were commenting that my whole my whole argument is like an argument from silence. And they're like, kind of right. But the way that I view this argument is that the anonymity hypothesis is just that. There is silence about the authorship of the Gospels for the first hundred years after they were written. That's it. The anonymity hypothesis doesn't state that like people were like, yep, this is anonymous. We have no idea who wrote this because that just wasn't how people talked back then. Tons of like most of the Old Testament is anonymous. Nobody was looking at like the book of Job, for instance, being like, I wonder who wrote this. Nobody. It was normal for things to be anonymous. So I think that the gospels were circulating and the apostolic fathers were silent about who wrote them. So am I making an argument from silence? Kinda? But that kind of just is the gospel anonymous hypothesis. So I guess what I would ask the kinds of people who say like, having your case isn't convincing because it's an argument from silence. I suppose I would ask you this. So if my point is simply that, Everybody was silent about who wrote the Gospels until over, a, like, roughly 100 years after they were written. What kind of evidence would you look for? To me, this has, like, this is kind of like the cheese in the fridge thing. Like, if I said I think that the fridge is silent about the cheese. So if the, if the fridge doesn't have any cheese, and then we found no evidence of cheese in the fridge, I'm good. Um, and that's, that's the argument that I'm making about the Gospels. I think that the apostolic fathers are silent about the authorship of the gospels. That's it. That's my whole point. And so I don't know where else to look besides the apostolic fathers and look for any evidence of them calling the gospels by name. And they don't. And I, and that's kind of the whole point. So that was something that I did want to bring up like upon reflection. Um, like, yeah, maybe I am making an argument from silence, but, but that kind of is just what the anonymity hypothesis is. So anyway, uh, that's the end of my reflection for today. And hey, I hope that you all enjoyed the debate. I know that I enjoyed it a ton. Uh, I really want to do more debates on like textual criticism stuff, sure. But then also just kind of on like other Catholic topics. Really, I do want to say with Catholic topics because that's kind of the point of my channel. But I had so much fun. I learned a lot too. Um, not just in preparation, but I learned just a lot, even just from Dave, like while I'm sitting there listening to him talk. I thought it was awesome. I want to do it again. Maybe one of you guys want to debate me. Uh, hey, if you do, shoot me an email. I would love to debate you. Uh, could be on my show, could be on somebody else's show. I don't really care. And it, it could be more formal. It could be less formal than the one that I did with Dave. I think that formality has its place, but I personally learn more from informal settings than I do from formal settings. 
but that's just me. Thanks everybody. Thanks for listening. Thanks for reflecting with me. And uh, until next time.